On behalf of King's College London and the various um, Pericles partners, uh, too numerous to mention, I'm very happy to welcome you to this, the, um, well, to the Welcome Collection Centre for this, the uh, final project conference of, of Pericles. Um, although it's a Pericles final event, of course, it's not just a conference about Pericles, rather it's a conference that aims to address a, a range of themes relating to digital preservation and sustainability that cropped up at various times during the project, as well as among the broader uh, digital preservation community. The broad theme of the conference is change, specifically acting on change, and I guess implicitly um, also more proactively anticipating potential change so that one is ready for it when it inevitably happens. <clears throat> um, if I may be permitted just to reminisce for a moment, um, I just wanted to think back to when I first became involved in digital preservation. I just joined the now defunct Arts Humanities Data Service, where I met, in fact, William, who used to work there at the same time. Um, as I was a complete neophyte in the field, on my first day they were telling me how everything, how it all worked, this digital preservation stuff. File format obsolescence was then the driving issue and they explained to me how a depositor gave them some files and they transformed them into to nice sustainable formats rather than the sort of horrid Microsoft ones or whatever that um, uh, they were given. And then they added them to their archive. You know, what happened then I asked? Well, they'd come back in a few years and check them again. What about this collection, I said, pointing at something that was a bit more complicated. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was a sort of you know, web resource or that used proprietary software and no doubt specific libraries and so on. And, well, they weren't really sure. Well, the point of this little anecdote is that nearly 15, that's nearly 15 years ago, but we're still struggling to keep up with issues of technological obsolescence of various types. Not only that, there's perhaps even more challenge, challenging aspects of change um, within the digital environment. Changes in semantics, you know, broader changes, transformations within culture and society um, that can affect how digital material is accessed uh, and used or consumed, as people sometimes say. So we need perhaps to rethink our approaches to dealing with these multiform changes that will always be with us. Um, and to readjust our perspectives, our assumptions, and our practices. Also, the increasing bigness, if you like, of digital information, so not just in terms of sheer bytes, but also in terms of the increasing complexity and, and dyna dy I can't say this word, dynamicity of the, the digital objects that need to be preserved. That's probably, if you, if you look at the big data world, it's the three Vs they talk about. Um, Means also means that purely manual approaches to creation are increasingly infeasible and ways of automating appraisal and other forms of decision making and risk um, uh, assessment are needed to meet the, meet the challenge. Also, while the, while the ideas of digital preservation have become more mainstream within memory institutions and university libraries and um, you know, research centres with a remit to manage um, research data, and actually also the informed population in general, you know, every quite frequently now I come across digital preservation related articles in the mainstream press, but there's still an ongoing debate about how to deal with this breadth of change, you know, what models and approaches to use, um, how are the available tools adequate to meet the needs of, uh, of the practitioners, the users, and if not, how can we bridge this so-called capability gap and move from theory to successful practice? Well, it's the aim of this conference to debate some of these issues that have surfaced in recent years and to develop an understanding of and, and hopefully maybe some influence over the direction of the digital preservation field in the years to come. To that end, the conference is bringing together a, a wide range of people, practitioners, researchers, solution providers, who are all actively engaged in the field. And over the next three days, through our keynotes, various panel discussions, thematic, um, oops, I better hurry up, um, and practical demonstrations, we hope to be able to explore these challenges and investigate how we can respond to them. So I'd like to thank various people for their hard work in getting the conference together, in particular Pericles organising team, um, the Digital Preservation Coalition, and we hope that in the next three days will provoke a, a, an interesting, spirited and productive dialogue and discussion, and the conference will inspire some new thinking and approaches in the field. So we wish you a very enjoyable conference. Before we proceed to the conference itself, um, I'd like to ask uh, Simon Chaplin, who's the director of culture and society at the welcome um, to say a few words. Uh, Simon. Thank you very much, Mark, and, uh, and welcome everybody. So on behalf of the Welcome Trust, very pleased to uh, be uh, hosting you today. I'm delighted to see so many of you here. 
talking, thinking, working on a challenge that is affecting us all. Um, so for those of you who don't know, welcome. Uh, we're a global charitable foundation. Uh, our mission is to improve health for everyone by helping great ideas to thrive. Uh, welcome Collection is part of what we do, a space that explores how people think and feel about health and is designed to kind of challenge ways of thinking. And I hope that in that context, it's a great setting for you today. Like all organisations, Welcome understands this sense of change around us. And in fact, one of the big ways in which we've tried to adapt to that is by moving beyond the idea of a corporate plan, a kind of five-year plan, a ten-year plan, recognising that we simply don't know what the world holds for us in the future. And that if an organisation like Welcome, like your organisations too, I expect, is going to be able to deal with change, then it can't commit to long-term inflexible objectives. We need to give ourselves agility, flexibility, the ability to respond, but at the same time to keep some sense of compass, a north star that guides what we're doing. Nowhere is that more important than in the uh, sphere of technological change. And there is a sense there that we live in an era of astonishing advance, but in fact, when you start to unpack that, you realize that not every change is a progressive improvement, that change can be disruptive, change can be regressive. We've seen that, for example, in some of the public debate around the use of digital health data, for example. <clears throat> And so we shouldn't assume that change brings with it benefits. Change is something that we respond to. The benefits are things that we make ourselves. When it comes to dealing with change, particularly technological change, one of the key principles we have to bear in mind is not to be driven by these constant advances. There's a sense sometimes that we're on the edge of a breaking wave. And that by being on the edge of the breaking wave, there's a kind of forward momentum that we can't stop. One of the great things about a meeting like this, I hope, is the chance to step back and to look at what we're doing to make sure we're not just going in the right direction, advancing on the right front, but we're actually fighting the right battles. So for Welcome, for example, it's about stepping back and making sure that when we talk about digital data, we're doing that in the context of an environment of public trust about how data can and should be used. When it comes to talking about advances in digital preservation, we're stepping back and making sure that we're preserving the stuff that needs to be preserved and preserving it for the uses that we can recognise now and for uses that we can predict in the future. Our job is always to kind of step back from the breaking wave and take that bigger perspective in order to give ourselves some distance and some confidence that what we're doing is not just right for the short term, but right for the long term too. I hope that today you have a fruitful day, some good discussion, some provocative presentations, and that you go away from this feeling energized and enthused and ready to take on these challenges. On behalf of Welcome, thank you very much indeed, and I hope you enjoy the day. Thank you, Simon. I was worried I was going to get um, run out of time. We've actually got we're actually well on time, so um, that's good news. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Cara Van Malsen. Uh, Cara is a consultant and partner at AV Preserve. This is uh, AV Preserve is a consultancy and, and software development company um, that focuses on data management and, and digital preservation, um, in particular, as you might guess, from the name of, of audio and visual material. Um, <clears throat> Now, the continuing role of OAS was a topic that came up time and time again um, during Pericles and also elsewhere in the community over the last um, few years. So we're very pleased to be able to kick off this event with Cara's talk, which is called Seeing the Forest for the Trees, a look outside the OAS o AIS reference model. Thank you, Cara. Um. 30 minutes, is that correct? <laughs> okay, just want to make sure. Okay, so hi. Um, I just, first of all, want to thank um, the Welcome Collection for, for hosting us and thank the organizers for inviting me, especially to Pip Lawrenson. Thank you for, for asking me to come and speak this morning. Um, and it's exciting to be with you all. I haven't been involved in the Pericles project, obviously. Um, I'm American, so um, this is a European project. So maybe um, the idea was to bring over a different perspective from across the pond. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping I can provide that this morning. So um, I'm actually uh, 
really enjoyed the comments that Simon just made. Did he leave already? Um, but I think what I'm going to talk about this morning may, um, uh, you know, kind of be a, a, along similar lines. So, um, you know, we'll see. So um, I'm going to introduce uh, AV Preserve a little bit more in just a second. Um, what I just want to do now is just to say that the, the focus of this presentation is going to be about looking, you know, kind of taking a, a higher level view of um, digital preservation, not within the, what I'm going to call the box of the OAAS model. Um, so I'm going to refer to this inside the box versus outside the box issue. And I want to look outside the box this morning. Um, so that's hence the, the title, kind of the forest for the trees, um, looking at the ecosystem a little more broadly. So where's my clicker thing? Here we go. Okay. All right. So 20 years ago, um, it's been exactly 20 years since the publication of a report called Preserving Digital Information that was uh, released by a task force on uh, digital archiving digital information. Um, that was a commission of the Commission on Preservation and Access and the Center for Research Libraries in the United States. Um, that report sort of laid the groundwork for a lot of things that have come since then. A lot of the work that we've been pursuing you know, as a profession over the last 20 years is sort of called for these, I, this concept of, a, of preservation repositories um, as the kinds of entity that would be responsible for ensuring long-term accessibility of digital information. It also um, suggested that it would be important that these repositories be certified. Um, so it sort of, you know, paved the way for the ISO 16363 or, and, of course, the TRAC and Nestor and other kinds of projects that, that came before it. Um, so if we kind of look 20 years later, where, where are we now? Um, we've made tremendous progress and we've pursued those recommendations. Um, we've largely, um, you know, realized many of them. We've actually done more in some areas and maybe in er some areas that they recommended we've done a little less, but obviously things have ch changed tremendously in the last 20 years. Um, but, you know, here are just a few of the sort of strides that we've made in that time. Um, we have, you know, very wide adoption of the OAS model and concept. We have good maturity models. We have criteria for assessment. Um, we have very mature technology now. Um, obviously, more and more, it's you know getting better and better all the time. Um, we have professional communities of practice. You know, here we are today. Um, there are many other such you know events. Um, we have the PASIG. We have IPRES. We have others, um, and we have training that's increasingly widely available. So. I think you know this is this is fantastic, and we should celebrate the work that we have done over over the last 20 years. But we know that we're not done. You know, there's a lot more to do. And um, what I'm going to suggest today is that um, while the work that we've done, sort of focusing in on that inside the box, like how do we actually do digital preservation? How do we you know? tackle various types of media, you know, what are sort of the strategies and approaches, and so things like the levels of digital preservation that the NDSA um, organization in, this, in the U.S. Has, has published, or the ISO 16363 criteria, really do look largely inside of the box. How do you actually execute preservation and do that well? Um, to some extent, they, there is a peripheral view, what happens just on the outside, but um, that's not exactly where the focus has been, for good reason. So what I want to argue today is that maybe some of us might take this, this time, now that we've, we've gotten pretty good at figuring out how to do the inside the box piece and see what we can do from the outside. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about you know, what I'm seeing as, um, in, my, in my role and why I think this is an issue right now. So, to introduce who am I and where am I coming from and what do we do. So um, as you heard, we're, we're an information management um, consulting and software development firm. So we work with a wide variety of organizations. Um, you know, a few of them are listed here. The unique thing about this is that we're able to, um, you know, see patterns across various types of organizations, large and small, 
from different sectors, public, private. Um, you know, we've got universities, um, Hollywood studios, museums, ar archives, libraries, so all kinds. Um, and, and so when it's interesting when we start to see sort of patterns emerge across these, and I'm gonna talk about that a little more. Um, we have several areas of expertise, um, hint, you know, as, as we heard already, so our name comes from our origins being in audiovisual, and we do have a component of our work that is focused on audiovisual. Um, that's my background. I, I have a master's in moving image archiving and preservation, so that's where I came from. Um, but as we've, in the last, you know, several years, moved toward digital preservation, we're a little more um, you know, neutral in terms of content and media type. We're not specifically AV, but, um, so we have several areas of expertise. These are just a few of them. These are not, these are not all, but, you know, digital preservation is one of those. And within digital preservation, we get to do a few different types of things. Um, we do things like help our clients, you know, develop requirements for technologies. We help them write RFPs. We help them select technologies. Uh, we do some custom software development ourselves. We've built a couple of tools you might be familiar with, which we've released as open source tools to the community. Um, Fixity is one of them. It's a little Fixity checker tool, you know, kind of not surprising. Another tool is, is called Exactly. Um, so check those out if you're not familiar with them. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about those. I'm gonna talk more about these other two that you see here on the screen. Um, at the very bottom, and I'm really what I'm really going to focus on is the the last one. The um, the only reason I'm bringing up the other one is I want to do a little bit of a contrast. So, what was I going to say about that? Um, yeah, sorry, <laughs> just double check. Um, about five years ago, I'd say um, we started to get inquiries from our clients who were who had been building digital preservation environments or repositories or, you know, were kind of in early stages of development or kind of had fairly mature preservation environments. And they said, hey, can you come in and do sort of an assessment for us of where we are, um, what our capabilities are and, you know, how mature we are and where we should go from here? Where, where are the gaps and where do we need to go? Um, and so, and they wanted to do that in a standards-based way. So we started um, developing a service around ISO 16363, the trustworthy audit uh, repositories um, audit criteria, um, doing assessments according to that. And, and so that's one type of project that we've been doing. And then more recently, in the last, I'd say, two years, we've started to get inquiries from either from some of the same clients who we've done those ISO 16363 assessments with, but also some other clients, and they're calling saying, hey, can you come in and take a look at the entire organization? We've got some digital preservation going on, but we've also got, um, you know, we, we're not feeling that it's quite coordinated and aligned, you know, and so we're calling internally at AV Preserve, we're calling these organizational alignment projects, really for lack of a better term, um, but that's just what we've been calling them so far. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about each of these briefly. And just to kind of frame it a little bit, again, that, that ISO 163 assessment type project um, is the inside the box project. I mean, it obviously has to look, if, you, if you're familiar with the standard, it talks about organizational issues, organizational infrastructure. So that's kind of taking a broader view, but it's really about how those um, organizational infrastructures impact this OAS kind of box. Um, whereas these organizational alignment projects is a broader ecosystem view. Um, they're saying, yeah, we've got this maybe OAS type environment over here, but like take a look at the broader ecosystem and help us see where we are today and figure out where we can go from here. So um, the, the assessments, again, inside the box, so we've, we've developed a couple of different approaches to, to, for these types of um, engagements. So we've done several, um, actually quite a number of these full assessments where we take all of the criteria of the standard and we evaluate each one individually. So we score them, we prioritize them, we, you know, we sort of look at when should you address this? Is this a high, high priority? Is this a lower priority? We categorize them, and I'm gonna talk more about the categories we use in just a minute. Um, 
we sort of lay them on the timeline. So you know, this we, we only look at whether something should be addressed in the short term, medium term, or sustain what you're doing. We don't have a long term category because the idea is once you're past the medium term, which is like a two to three year, it's time to take an, you know, a new look at, at everything you're doing again. So you know, that constant change sort of drives us to keep having to reflect on the work we're doing. So the end result is not, this is not an audit. The, the goal is not to say whether you're certified. It's, it's really to help the organization pursue their goals. And sometimes those goals may be to eventually get to certification, but oftentimes it's just help us do a better job. We want to be more standards compliant. You know, what do we need to do from here? So we give a set of recommendations and, and a roadmap, and that's the outcome. We've done, we've sort of a service which is more of a light assessment where we don't score every single uh, individual criteria. We, we sort of do a category level and then, um, but similarly provide recommendations and a roadmap from there. So the other kind of project looks something like this. Um, we've got organizations, and, and let me say, the types of organizations that are asking for this type of project are, they're not necessarily larger, but maybe they're larger. Um, they, they're, more, they're somewhat complex. Um, they've got collections or even things you know, that are not considered collections but are still content of value um, all throughout in the organization. So this, think about universities where you have within a library, a university library, you might have more than one special collection, archive, and each of those. So those are kind of collections that are of value. But then across the entire organization, you've got research data. You might have um, art museums, galleries within that university setting. And so they're going, oh, maybe we need to get together and figure out what we're doing here. Um, or you know, if you, even just within a single museum, the museum might have um, the museum collection, an archive, a library, but also other parts of that organization that are producing um, output. The institution itself is outputting uh, content of value, and there's a recognition that those things might not be um, stewarded in a way that will ensure their long-term availability. So they're sort of coming to us and, and asking, um, you know, Hey, can you help us like figure this out? We want what's going on here, and these types of projects are being um, initiated by senior management, and they're usually involving a kind of cross institutional consortial um, group to help guide it. And so, what they really want to do is go from this to something like this, where everybody is kind of all in line, and we're doing things, you know, together, and we've got a plan, and it's all working smoothly. They want to operationalize digital preservation. They feel that, um, as it is now, that digital preservation, where it's happening uh, within their institution, is still sort of a boutique approach. It is still manual, um, and it requires a lot of human intervention and time. Um, and, they, and, and at the same time, there's a lot of content that's falling outside of the, the preservation kind of work that's going on, and there are gaps and there are huge risks. So they're saying to us, like, how can we operationalize what we're doing here? And so that's what we're trying to help them figure out. So this is the focus of, or this is the, this type of project, I guess, and the, the fact that we're getting so many calls about this lately. Um, and again, this has just been in the last two years, and we've had, um, I think we've probably completed about six of these, and they're like six-month-long engagements um, that we've been doing. That They're calling us independently. It's not like we're going out advertising this as a service we do now. We've got, but it's just an interesting to notice the different types of organizations all having the same issue. So maybe this is not surprising to any of you. Um, and maybe this is a unique thing in the States, I'm not sure, but I'm guessing probably, probably not. So, um, so I wanna talk a little bit more about the sort of challenges to operate, oper I now cannot say that word, <laughs> operationalizing um, digital preservation, because really that's what we wanna get to. Um, as you know, we've already heard this morning, it's becoming increasingly difficult given the scale that we're dealing with today to um, 
to have such manual processes and so much intervention and so much decision making. Um, and we need to move past that and get this stuff kind of churning um, in an ongoing, ongoing way. Um, we're still in many organizations, and I'm definitely not saying all, um, but many organizations are still stuck, and especially those that have this sort of varied content and varied types of um, uh, groups of, of folks that are responsible for, for preservation or stewardship or content collection and management. So I want to revisit this ISO assessment kind of um, project just briefly, because I want to draw a comparison between the two types of projects. So when I mentioned before, I said that we do a categorization um, for each of those ISO uh, 16363 metrics. Um, we, we've categorized them according to whether they relate, and a, these could be one or more. So each metric may be about documentation, policy, procedure, uh, functionality. And when I say functionality, I, I, that's largely about software, but not necessarily. It could, could be something um, a person does. It doesn't have to be software. Um, infrastructure in this category is more about the hardware, the backbone um, kinds of, of, of things that are important in a preservation environment. And then operations is the human part, um, this, the financial, the rights, the, you know, that kind of whole mess of things. So I am going to very quickly get a glass of water. I apologize. And is this, is this lapel mic on? Is it? I can't tell. Um, so if you, if you look at the two different um, pie charts there, you see that in the left-hand side, the, these types of assessments, what we're finding as the biggest gaps are in the documentation, policy, and procedure. These types of projects are, again, we've got a preservation repository, it's already working, come help us figure out how we can make it better. And usually, a lot of investment has been put into the technology portion of this. That's typically where people start. Um, so that part is usually pretty good, at least in the cases that we've looked at. Um, and so that's why you're not seeing big gap areas there. In the second type of project, and again, this, is, this may be the same organization. We're just looking at two different sets of questions. The second type of project where we're, we're finding the biggest gap areas are in these um, operational side of things. It's, it's the kind of people issue. And I'll come back to what I mean by that in a minute. Um, Policy is another big problem and documentation to some extent. The reason why documentation figures so prominently in the first type of project is because the standard asks for evidence of every single metric. So if you don't have documentation supporting what you're doing, then you kind of lose points. So, um, and typically that's like the last thing people do. So, so this is, um, I wanna talk about the, again, uh, organizational alignment type projects. What we're seeing when in, in these projects across pretty much all of them is, is patterns. Um, these are sort of typical kinds of shortcomings that we're, we're coming across. Um, where there's not policy, where it's needed, and that doesn't mean that there's no policy, it means that it's not addressing all of the content of value that that organization is concerned about. Um, it also may um, be a little bit less clear in terms of terminology. That's another big issue. Um, another going across, again, we might have really exceptional preservation work going on, but it's happening in silos and they're uncoordinated. Um, and there's no oversight to help kind of bring those together. So that's, again, here, the next one the lack of sort of central oversight and concerted, coordinated kind of um, view of these things. There's insufficient infrastructure to support all the content of value, um, but it's harder to say that there's inf insufficient infrastructure when we kind of haven't all identified all, what all the content of value actually is. So that's a sort of tricky situation. Um, but as a result of a lot of this, the content creators, the people responsible for either um, creating content, and, and this is sort of in the like research data sense, 
um, or even the, the, the parts of the organization that are doing digitization, but they're not necessarily the ones that should be responsible for the long-term preservation part, they're sort of unreasonably burdened. And many of them don't necessarily have the expertise, the resources, or the incentives to do preservation work. It's really not their role. And so they, while they have the greatest intentions usually to ensure longevity, um, it's not always within their, um, their purview to, to actually make that happen. And so um, another problem is we don't often see a digital preservation mandate. While an organization may have a preservation mandate that they work hard to achieve, that does not always translate into a digital preservation mandate. And because of this, there's a lot of confusion, lack of clarity. There can be a lot of complacency. Um, because people, it's hard to kind of get your arms around this big, big picture problem and people just say, well, I can focus on this and I can do this thing well, so let me just do that. And understandably, like that's, that's what you have to do. So, um, so, so these again, we're seeing this across all types of organizations. It's, it's not unique to any one type. And so what I want to talk about a little bit more is why this might be happening. And, um, and I, I, I want to argue that it's, it's sort of a, a people problem. And not that, you know, it, what I mean by people problem is that there are societal and cultural norms and values that impact our work um, in a way that makes it difficult to operationalize preservation. And I want to recognize them in this presentation, that the, really the, the issues. Let's acknowledge that these are issues and they exist and how do we kind of embrace them and move past them to, to reach our goals. So there's two issues I wanna talk about. Um, and one of them has already sort of been brought up, actually they've both been brought up today. So I, I think even though I don't know what the rest of you are gonna say, I hope we're kind of on some of the same page. <laughs> so the first point is that I wanna talk about is this sort of obsession with innovation that we have as a culture um, and how that sort of has an effect on what we're trying to achieve. And the second one is, is the actual slow pace of lasting change and the fact that it really takes a long time for things to settle and become the norm and actually so we can move forward. So I want to talk about each of these just briefly. So first, I want to mention this. Um, podcast that was recently aired on Freakonomics Radio. Does anyone listen to that? A few of you? Did you hear this one? Anyone? One person? All right. <laughs> OK. Well, I encourage you all to um, check it out. Uh, it's a great podcast. If you, I mean, Freakonomics Radio in general is a great podcast. But this episode, to me, it really resonated. And, and as soon as I heard it, I was like, whoa, like, this is really, this is what we're, we're doing here. Um, the other reason why this is an interesting episode is because the president of our company was actually featured on this, this episode. So we had Larry Summers, the former president of Harvard University and economic advisor to Obama, and then Chris Lucinic, the president of AV Reserve. We were like, whoa, that's so cool. So um, the, the, the episode raised this question, the sort of overarching premise of the thing was, has our culture's obsession with innovation led us to neglect the fact that things also need to be taken care of. So they weren't saying, it wasn't a question of whether there's an innovation obsession, it was saying there is an innovation obsession. And I think that we could probably acknowledge that that is true um, as a culture. And so, uh, you know, I mentioned Larry Summers and Chris Lucinic, um, but another, two of the other people were interviewed for it were um, Andrew Russell and Lee Vinsel. <laughs> Um, they've recently published an article called Hail the Maintainers, um, published in an in a online magazine or online publication called Aeon. So um, in that article, the, the authors basically say that the, the work of maintainers are those individuals whose work keeps ordinary existence going rather than introducing novel things. And a brief reflection demonstrates that the vast majority of human labor is of this type, upkeep. Um, 
And yet they note that despite the fact that the vast majority of people do up the upkeep type of work and the vast majority of labor is this type, this is not what's valued in our culture today. So just to kind of demonstrate that this really, you know, is sort of a thing, I, I was looking at, you know, Google search trends. And so you can go on Google and they have this search trends tool and you, I plugged in innovation and maintenance. So this is about the frequency of the search actually being performed in Google. And innovation came up 23 times more than maintenance came up in Google search. So, I mean, innovation is a buzzword of the, not the day, it was like the buzzword of like last decade. And people are even trying to downplay this as like the cool term, but I think we still, know that this is the issue, you know, this is something that we, we can't get away from. People are very excited by this idea of iteration and disruption and all that kind of stuff. And I think that as a profession, we are, you know, not immune to this, of, of course. Like, we are in this culture where this innovation obsession is happening, and we have to work within it. And so this affects our ability to, you know, operationalize digital preservation in a couple of ways. One is... Um, you know, first of all, we digital preservation is a maintenance task. We we have to you know we recognize that um, we are trying to maintain the things that have come before. But um, within our organizations, we have to be um, you know we we have to kind of chase the next shiny thing all the time. That's always what's happening, and it's a distraction. And but it's where the money's coming from. It's where the um, you know where people are are you know the funders are are interested so you don't get funding for maintenance you get funding for doing digitization not for maintaining the result of digitization um, you get money for doing a cool new website um, not for maintaining the website so what you see over and over and over again is this sort of um, lack of maintenance of the innovative stuff even within our uh, within our profession another thing that that I think we're noticing too is that even within um, digital preservation and leaving out the shiny things, but we are kind of looking for the promise of the next new technology all the time. Like, oh, once we get that technology, everything will be fine. You know, we, so we're a little bit distracted by that innovative thing that's coming, which maybe it's not coming, or maybe it won't solve all your problems, and I'm gonna tell you, it won't, um, is, is a distraction. So the innovation impulse is sort of permeates, and it's a pull we're always fighting against. It's also one of the reasons we struggle with um, engaging content creators in the preservation process. A lot of these folks who are pre creating content that we're supposed to be preserving are supposed to be innovating. That's their role. Our role is you know, maintenance. And so our incentives are much different. And I think even with the best of intentions, when content creators really want to ensure their, their content is preserved, they, again, don't always have the incentives or the reward system to do this. And, and th so there's a struggle, and we know that the biggest bottleneck in the preservation process is just getting the stuff in, just the ingest part. And so I think Matthew, tomorrow, where are you, Matthew? Hi. So I'm sort of throwing you a, you know, something here. You're going to be talking about this, I think a bit more, how do we actually push preservation up the pipeline into the, into the concrete, content creation? Um, and I hope you're gonna have some good ideas for us. But I think we have to recognize that this is, this is a challenge, that there is a different kind of incentive system for each of these groups. So I just wanna briefly mention that. The second issue that's challenging our ability to sort of operationalize digital preservation. And again, there are many, many issues. These are the two issues I wanna talk about. So, is the slow pace of lasting change. And so I've been doing um, some reading on change and the author, John Cotter, um, is you know, one of these leading thinkers on this issue and he's written several books called Leading, on the topic of leading change, not change management, but leading change. Um, and he notes that the, um, it's important to recognize that the change process does go through a series of phases which require a considerable length of time um, to finally become like cemented in the culture of an organization. Um, and that the second point he makes is that the, the core of the matter is about changing the behavior of people. That's, that's really the biggest challenge to the long-term change. So, I was thinking about this quite a bit recently and, and I was doing some interviews for, for a project and 
I was asking the you know interviewees like, what is your greatest digital preservation challenge today? And I heard some of responses which were sort of like this one, but um, you know this I actually wrote it down exactly verbatim, so I was like, oh great, I have a quote. Um, the interviewee said he said coming up with a plan, sticking with it, and getting buy-in, and and that's kind of exactly what we hear over and over and over again. Um, that organizations they know what to do, but they're they're having trouble making decisions. Um, getting alignment on those decisions because the decision makers are, are sort of struggling like what should we decide and then the people who are doing the work on the ground are like well we need you to make that decision and there's sort of like this impasse with that sort of sticking with it and getting buy-in is is something that they're struggling with in like getting that change to sort of take hold so this is taking a long time we know that the digital preservation is a change management issue. It's a change issue. We have to change the, the kind of work practices that we, we've been accustomed to in this field um, or in, in kind of fields that we're coming from. So we know this is a large scale organizational change challenge, but we also have to recognize that this lasting organizational change is going to take concerted effort over many years. Um, so again, just want to acknowledge that that is important. And now, no American can come over and not talk about their recent election results um, to illustrate a point. <laughs> so I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Um, I mean, how can you not think about this a lot lately, right? Um, and you all, obviously, in Europe, have had similar kinds of um, surprising uh, outcomes from recent election kinds of issues. So. I think there's, a, there's several parallels that we could look at here. One is that um, there are a lot of people that feel, that felt that we were really making strides moving past certain issues of, say, discrimination against sex, race, religion, et cetera. Um, and the result, and actually the, the whole temperament of the entire election, Revealed that we had we are not moving past those things, and there you know there's sort of a backlash even against the I, the desire to move past these things or to you know kind of resolve them. And so people feel that you know we've so we've taken five steps back, and, and in a way we have. But that kind of change that we're looking for in societal kind of practices, just like relationships with people and. It's slow, it doesn't happen over, it takes a really long time. And so we have to take a few steps forward and a few steps back. So that's one type of parallel. Another one, I, I think, I'm, you could, you could, if you've been to the States and you've, if you've driven around, you've probably noticed that we do really have some crumbling infrastructure. Um, so that's just kind of separate from the election issue, but it's just another parallel to preservation work and that maintenance is not really what's valued. Um, we kind of wait till it actually falls apart and then we scramble to repair it. And I think that's kind of what we're doing with a lot of digital preservation. We're not operationalizing our maintenance of infrastructure. We're not also operationalizing maintenance of our, of our resource of our content. So, I don't know, happy to talk more about whatever you think about the parallels of the recent election, um, but I'll just leave it with that. So, again, I think we really should celebrate where we've come from and all the achievements we've made, and we've, we've made tremendous progress in the last 20 years, but we really have focused uh, largely on that inside the box area, and, and that, uh, did, I mean, exclusively, a lot of work has been done on the outside of the box, but I'd like to propose that we, we start working on a little bit more on this. Um, so, so how do we do that? Where do we go from here? Um, a few suggestions, just to kind of recap, really. We need to recognize that our work is maintenance, but it's even us that doesn't always value that. We are victims of the innovation obsession, too. We have to find ways to close that incentive gap between the content creators and ourselves. We can't just be like, it's good for you. You really, you'll love it once you do this preservation work. Help us out. They're like, what are you talking about? So um, we need to reassess our resource allocation as a profession. And I don't mean like where we put our money in our institutions. I mean where our energy is focused. Like, If you kind of do some, I think we're going to talk about like risk assessment modeling here. Um, this, the next two days, but if you sort of prioritize risks on a, on a scale, 
the like fixity one is kind of low, you know? So, and we've done a lot of work on that and I think we know how to do it. The thing that's higher up on that scale is getting the content in, like actually making sure we are even doing the bare minimum for the, the all the stuff of value. We need to kind of return to that issue. Um, we need to resist the urge to become distracted by the next shiny thing. Um, and remember that change, lasting change takes a long time. And I would say we need to look at other communities because we don't have all the answers and um, they don't. all the solutions don't require our subject matter expertise. So I don't have time to talk about this, um, but this is a set of suggestions um, of ways that we can start to work toward overcoming the challenges and operationalizing and really capitalizing on those shiny new object kind of innovation challenges. Um, we need to kind of like focus on those as small wins, but don't let them become a, a distraction. It seems like oftentimes they're, they're sort of, yay, we did that thing, great, good job. Oh, we can go on to something else. But it's, we have to use those as momentum to keep going. Um, so this is sort of an adaptation of the, um, I was mentioning John Cotter, the leading change thinker guy. Um, some of his, he's got an eight step kind of um, process for implementing lasting change. This is um, my adapted version of that work in progress. I'd be happy to talk to you all about that. But we, we really need to think about in some of these areas, how can we work with other organizations, other communities to help us with this? So like for the first one, instill a sense of urgency. We really need to raise the alarm bell past our echo chamber. And maybe we should talk to marketing folks about that. Maybe some people have tried that before, but I think we could revisit. If we can get them to communicate back to the general public the importance of doing this, I don't think we've quite figured out how to do that. At Customs the other day, I came in yesterday and the guy was like, what are you here for? Like digital preservation conference. What's digital preservation? I was like, well, you know, it's this and this and this. And he's like, ah, oh, I thought that stuff just took care of itself. Can you just put it on a hard drive? You've all had that conversation a thousand times, right? So, and we, still don't have a good way of telling them like what, you know, you can explain it and they're like, hmm, okay. But you know, the sense of urgency isn't there. And so there've been some great journal, there's some been some good journalism about this, but there needs to be more. Um, another one is, you know, in ensuring alignment and accountability. So we need to kind of create ways of getting, giving feedback loops of, um, you know, once the practices are sort of established and, and the technology is there and the procedures are there. How do we ensure people are actually doing it and we're giving them the feedback they need? Um, because there's often a lot of sort of a top down, like just do this and then they're like, but, but. So how can we kind of, you know, maybe we should look at behavioral scientists as people that we might want to work with and how can we do this better, incentivize people, actually motivate them to do it. And so lastly, we, we do have to maintain and keep up the work, it's upkeep. Um, we need to demonstrate the connections between new behaviors and, and success and ensure continuity over time. I will stop there and um, thank you all very much. Thanks again for inviting me and I hope we'll have a really great conversation this week. Thanks. <laughs>